Hi, good morning. Happy Thursday to everybody. My name is Michelle Terman. I'm CEO of Catalyst Consulting Services, and I'm so excited that you could join us today to have a very um, confidential conversation if there are things that you are thinking about for your organization. And I'm really excited to actually be joined by Ron Cristaldi, who I will talk about in just a moment. But I wanted to just maybe do a few housekeeping rules. Um, I am going to actually take you all off mute. Um, that way you can be self muted. If you would like to introduce yourself in your organization, please feel free to do that in the chat box. And then if you have a question, something that arises as we're going through the topic, please feel free to type it in the question box. We will be taking a natural break and pause about every 15 minutes just to check in um, with each other and to see if there's any questions. But if there's something you want to make sure that we get to, please feel free to type that in. We are going to be recording today so that if you're participating, I please feel free to take notes, but we will provide the recording for you afterwards if you want to refer to any of this information. And we're more than happy to provide the PowerPoint for you in case you need that for future reference. So I want to first uh, tell you a little bit about Catalyst Consulting Services um, and really why we wanted to do this topic and, of course, why we pulled in Ron Cristaldi, uh, attorney with Shoemaker Loop. You know, I've been in this field 27 years working with nonprofits, and we started our company about seven years ago. And really with the main reason of trying to facilitate positive change for organizations. Some of the areas that we facilitate change, it's not the easiest change. In fact, one of the topics that we're talking about today is sometimes a difficult one to broach. Sometimes people are nervous to explore. But I find that since 2008, since the last time we had a financial crisis, even up until this year, organizations are rethinking things differently. And in particular, as it pertains to the topic today, we tend to focus more on executive uh, hiring, organizational management, training and fundraising, because we found that if you are entertaining these sort of high level discussions or looking to grow, you can't do it without the right people. You can't do it without a solid infrastructure, which needs to really be looked at on an annual basis. And you clearly can't do it without the funds or thinking about how you're going to work with somebody to develop those resources. So we do have support services. We're a turnkey nonprofit organization, as you will see. Um, we've raised over $75 million for a lot of the organizations we work with since 2014. We do cover the Southeast, and we'd say about 50% of our clients are in the social services sector. So a large portion of that um, is really what we service. And then 25% of that is going to be the arts and the remainder in healthcare. And then we also give back. We give back through our volunteer work and we also give back through corporate support, but for our clients so that there's really skin in the game. Um, we have had the fortune to work with a variety of partners in the community uh, to help them with their mission. Some are collaborative partners and then there are some that provide their level of expertise. And so that would include, for example, CPAs, attorneys, and so forth. And I've had the privilege to work with Ron um, probably since 2014. We've got a couple common clients that we've worked with over the years and just found a real trust there. We tend to tackle things like rewriting bylaws, articles of incorporation, working with complex board issues, for example, um, trying to work through that or maybe recruiting a board that is one of significance when you're looking at potential mergers. And we've also worked on the fundraising side as well. Um, so there's a lot of commonalities there in what we do. And for me, it always, I think, brings greater credibility when you can bring in an attorney uh, into the mix for a client because they may not have that resource. They may not um, you know, be able to have somebody on the board, for example, that's serving that niche. And so it's really a pleasure to be able to work with with Ron and their firm on these issues. And so with that, I'd like to really hand it over to Ron to talk a little bit about Shoemaker Loop and his experience as we jump into the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. And good morning, everyone. My name is Ron Cristaldi. Uh, as Michelle indicated, I'm the uh, president and CEO of Shoemaker Advisors and a partner with the Shoemaker Law Firm, Shoemaker Advisors is a public affairs firm that handles uh, lobbying and business-to-business -business 
type connectivity. Um, the Shoemaker uh, firm was founded in 1925, originally in Toledo, Ohio. We're now in five states, Ohio, Michigan, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida. And we've been in Tampa since 1985. And right now we are the largest law firm in the Tampa Bay area in the eight county region by way of number of lawyers uh, here in town. Uh, we're a full service law firm, a solutions oriented law firm with a strong culture of in involvement in the community. Uh, we do, for instance, as Michelle indicated, we partner with her quite a bit. We, I personally act as outside general counsel and outside specialty counsel for a wide range of not-for-profit organizations from very large, um, over $1 billion not-for-profit organizations down to very small uh, grassroots organizations. Um, and um, I uh, um, am pleased to be here today to help you all give some thought to the, the differences between uh, simply affiliating or partnering with another organization or maybe going the next step and combining operations as we go along. Um, Michelle, do we want to go on to the next slide here? Absolutely. Ron, are you able to see everything? I'm not, but I can work off the paper if, if that um, is, is fine. Um, okay, so we are um, here today to talk about the distinctions really between affiliations and mergers. Uh, we use the phrase partnership, but I want to point out that in legal context, partnership has a very specific meaning. It's a type of legal entity like a corporation or like a limited liability company. Here, when we use the phrase partnership, we're not using it in that legal sense of creating a legal entity. We're using it in the sense of two or more organizations coming together to work together um, more as an affiliation. Um, we've included this uh, poignant quote by Jeff Bezos, who uh, I think more than anybody else right now has been very successful in industry. No matter what your mission is, have some notion of in your head. Forget the model, whether it's government or not for profit or for profit. Ask yourself the more important question is my mission improving the world? Are you sure about it? Seek to, to disconfirm that all the time. And if you can, change your mission. So the idea here, and the reason we put this quote up first is, the thing that should drive you in all instances is your mission. If the activity, if the partnership, if the affiliation, if the merger does not further your mission, don't go beyond that, put it aside and move on to the next endeavor. So talking a little bit about what a partnership or what an affiliation is, it, it's two or more companies sharing a common goal, coming together to serve a common goal or purpose. It can take many forms. Um, for instance, affiliations can integrate programs or back offices. So if you have an organization, for instance, that has an educational component to its mission, uh, the affiliation can be centered around the educational component, although there could be other components to the mission of each organization. Um, or back office, for instance, it could be an affiliation to share some support services so that both missions can uh, be furthered. For instance, if you have two organizations in different regions, but they don't need to replicate the back office, they can affiliate to have an economy of scale. Um, or they can work together for a limited purpose or project, um, as a, for instance, in the um, terrible scenario of a hurricane hitting the region, you could have an organization that provides um, counseling services for the mental health issues associated with displacement, and you can have an organization that provides uh, food services for those who can't get food, and they may affiliate and partner for a year or two years or whatever time period might be necessary in order to serve that particular need and project, and once that need and project ends, the affiliation would end. Um, the terms and conditions of these types of affiliations are really dependent on what the parties want. They're negotiated terms in a contract. The law doesn't really provide or, or fill in any gaps. So the canvas is blank and you're able to really um, chart your own course without much restriction uh, as to how those two organizations would work together. And as I mentioned, there's not a strict legal definition of partnership or affiliation 
in, in this context, in the context we're using. Michelle, what, what, let's go to the next slide here. Thank you. So, uh, Michelle, would you prefer to walk through these or go ahead? And Michelle, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, I, I can't hear yeah. you. Other folks, oh, there you go. Okay, hey, perfect. I, I muted myself so you all wouldn't hear me, but I wanted to make sure that we had this slide because um, even in preparing this and working with Ron, I had found that I used certain terms interchangeably um, versus maybe the legal uh, termination with when we talk about partnership, affiliation, things of that nature. But there are certain considerations that usually you're going to be asking yourself if this is something that you want to consider. These are some questions and I wanted to walk through maybe some of the things, um, some highlights on these considerations and then have Ron chime in from a, a legal perspective. But um, having had some experience, our firm, also myself as a CEO, I've, I've done a couple mergers and uh, we'll share some of those experiences as we walk through this journey. These were some considerations that the first time I did it, I thought, gosh, I really wish I had somebody walk through that journey with me uh, in 2008. It just wasn't something we saw a lot of nonprofits doing, quite frankly, until maybe there was a financial reason to do so. But I think one of the first important questions is, what is the goal of the relationship and, and why, why is it going to be important for your organization? And so many of you may have either through strategic planning, maybe you've done it through a needs assessment of your stakeholders, for example, maybe even through a finding of a SWOT analysis, you're getting feedback from your stakeholders or your staff that there are certain things that either might be duplicative in your mission. There might be a, a competitor or a nonprofit that's offering similar services and it's something to be aware of. It could be that you're finding that funding is decreasing because there is a duplicity in mission or maybe your footprint or where you serve, your geographic area just you know isn't wide enough. We're starting to see that a lot with people that were in one county. And now, for example, if you're located in Tampa, might be looking to partner with Across the Bay in a Tampa Bay effort. We see this a lot with national organizations when they wanna become regional. We'll talk a little bit about that. You might also be considering it because you wanna look at some type of expansion. Um, if you are in the Tampa area, uh, we've seen this, for example, with organizations like Feeding Tampa Bay, who partnered with Trinity Cafe recently. Um, number one, for a variety of reasons, to continue to do good and feed more people and really try to assess the mission of hunger and no one to go hungry. But what does that look like? So typically when you're thinking about the goal, what is the ultimate goal of that relationship? Why are you thinking about approaching them? Will it further your mission? So typically you wanna look at what's the type of impact a potential partnership or a affiliation, an alliance will have. Will it provide more resources for you versus decreasing resources because you're in competition because you're able to serve more. You're able to have a greater impact in the community, for example. You're able to fulfill a greater need. The other question to ask, but it's one that usually isn't thought about at this level per se, and sometimes I think can stymie the conversation, um, is maybe including staff, but you're definitely going to need to think about what the board, staff and volunteers and donor support. The reality is that you're going to have to include the board members, as Ron will talk about, because they really are the legal entity if this is something that you're interested in and they will weigh in heavily. Um, there will be certain key staff that will probably need to participate either running financial scenarios and having your financial staff available or your programmatic staff and, and talking about what are some areas that we can strengthen or what are some areas that might be duplicitous. <coughs> Donors is something that can be somewhat of a challenge because they buy into your mission, but you shouldn't be dissuaded about that. At the end of the day, they have a connection because they believe in your mission. 
So if it is something that you can ultimately communicate that it's going to strengthen that impact, it's going to maybe assist in the financial future sustainability. Those are things that comes out from a communication stamp standpoint from a donor perspective. Can there be fallout? Potentially there can be fallout. It depends on who you partner with and the entity because it may not be just another similar nonprofit with a mission. It could be a university, it could be a college. Um, and so that's something that will weigh in ultimately as part of the decision-making process. Are there measurable goals that you're able to anticipate and how are you going to define success? And so usually when you get to this piece, and, and I know Juan will talk about this a little bit more, but you're gonna start to think about the considerations and either having a confidentiality agreement as you approach or go into something of this nature or some type of memorandum of understanding so that there's sort of a baseline of discussion that we're agreeing that the type of success or the goals were in this together because ultimately that's going to have to be communicated for consideration and what's the time frame so you know the time frame is going to be different for everybody i've seen organizations that might have a time frame that's different because like we saw in 2008 or like we're seeing now maybe they weren't set up for future sustainability in a way that would keep them moving forward in perpetuity so their timeline could be a lot more condensed because of the fact that they could potentially close their doors versus you might have someone who has been a visionary leader and really understands the organization watches the trends see what's happening in the industry um, and part of their strategic vision is you know either part of their succession planning or something they want to accomplish and their time frame might be two to five years out and it's a slow build so the time frame is really going to be something different and who really needs to be around that table so one of the things I would just share with you is that think about the board that you have today. And, and I don't mean to cause you pain for some of those that are struggling with your board, um, or you might have the perfect board, you think. But it really does take a very different skill set when you're walking through this journey. And sometimes you'll have board members that aren't as big picture. They might want to keep it small. And you might have some that might be a little bit more entrepreneurial. And so if you find that this is a struggle and also balanced with your time frame, that you're not able to get the right people on the actual board, something to consider is to put together a task force that has a mixture of some of the board members that it would be peer to peer, bringing back the progress, bringing back the basis of the discussions, but maybe you need to get some individuals like legal counsel, like somebody with a financial acumen, people that might need to be participatory in this experience and have a task force. It doesn't need to be full of board members per se, just to explore this. And so, as I mentioned, you know, things that will develop trust at the end of the day, there is that sort of contractual piece that confidentiality agreement, the MOU, because there will be a sharing of information that an attorney could draft for you um, and really kind of take on that role, which I know not, uh, Ron will talk about, but that is gonna be probably the first layer of, of, of trust there and how those conversations move forward. And then lastly, you know, what is the commitment to the relationship? Is it, you know, you want to move forward and have this and then you're done and there's a phase out period? Um, but what does a commitment look like prior, during, and moving forward? Because as you will hear with each type of uh, merger or partnership or affiliation, roles of some of the higher level staff will change. And so it's really important that those at that higher level that are really pushing that change stay involved um, until the internal systems and most of that gets fleshed out. So the commitment is really important. Um, sometimes you'll find that support staff might leave after something of this nature. You might even find board members move on because it might just have tired them out. Um, you might find that the leader says, this is sort of my last swan song. This is what I'm going to do for you. So it's really important to gauge, are people going to be in this for a certain amount of time? Because you're going to need that historical perspective. And if there are people that are not committed to a certain degree after the relationship, it is more imperative 
that you're really documenting these processes and bringing in a professional that can really guide them through that. So I'm just going to yeah. take a pause and see if, Ron, if you wanted to add anything to those considerations. Yeah, Michelle, that's a very comprehensive um, approach to it, and it spurred a couple of thoughts in my mind. I think the biggest challenge to all of your organizations and to all the clients that I've seen and the many that Michelle and I have worked on in the past is a little bit of lack of self-awareness and a little bit of fear of progressing into the unknown. And I'll, let me explain that for just one minute because I, I do uh, don't want to understate the fact that I do believe that those are the biggest challenges you'll face. Um, unlike the for-profit setting where these types of partnerships and mergers and acquisitions do happen all the time, there are financial incentives for individuals that help ally their personal fears or their personal anxieties about the transaction. In the not-for-profit setting, many of your organizations are 501c3 or 501c6 or other types of tax-exempt entities. There's, um, as you all probably well know, there's IRS prohibitions on excess benefits and, and private enrollment in those transactions, meaning that individuals can't receive more than fair market value for any goods or services they provide which makes it difficult to buy out individuals in these types of transactions in the not-for-profit setting. So that leaves the leadership in each organization to be reflective on their own personal interests and goals as opposed to the mission of the organization. And so it's, it's clear, and I think everyone would agree that as a fiduciary, the goals of the organization come first, but human nature is such that your colleagues and your board are going to question what's in it for them or, or put a different way what is the negative impact to them if we consolidate some back office uh, operation does that eliminate my job um, and what will happen to me um, it's important that the entire leadership team be self-aware of those tendencies um, be transparent in addressing those things there are uh, creative mechanisms and solutions that could be employed to ensure that individuals aren't left behind or left holding the bag or parts of the mission aren't left behind and left holding the bag. But I think as you go into any kind of a forward facing uh, partnership with a third party, it's important to be self-aware of your own, your own organization's tendencies. And what I've, what I've seen quite a bit is that one of two things happen. You have two healthy organizations who are self-aware and they are transparent with each other and they're able to engage in a way that's healthy for both missions and they both prosper. Uh, the other scenario I see is one organization that is not self-aware and they only engage in those types of discussions about affiliations and mergers at the point at which they're at some extremists. Their funding has been cut to the point where they can't go on with their operations anymore or their board dynamic has devolved to the point where it's not functional anymore. And at that point, you're really not able to enter into a healthy relationship with a third party because you're internally not healthy. So it's important to have those dialogues. It's important to do strategic planning uh, at least uh, once every few years, if not on an annual basis, and to have those things in mind. And the last thing, Michelle, that I'll mention is the question of where would these scenarios come into play and just thinking of a few examples of where they came into play um, in my experience and some things that you and I have done together um, I had one client that had a counterpart a, a protege company that um, was in North Florida that was unrelated to them no uh, shared control uh, but a very similar mission it's just that the the counterpart in North Florida was much smaller and couldn't provide the services in the same efficient manner as the organization in Tampa Bay. And ultimately, the merger that they were able to um, work out resulted in all of the operational aspects of the North Florida venture coming under the control and direction of the, of the Tampa Bay entity. And the Tampa Bay entity funded an account, a, a foundation, and the surviving entity in North Florida used that money to give grants out. And their sole purpose beyond that was as a granting agency to help further the mission. And it's worked wonderfully. That transaction happened uh, 10 years ago. On the flip side, I've worked with an organization that got both government funding and a private funding. 
and they also had an advocacy portion to their mission and found that their hands were tied quite a bit in advocating for policy change at the state and federal and local levels because of the government funding they received. So they spun off an organization to uh, focus solely on the government funded piece of it. They affiliated the two organizations with some close control, um, but the um, organization that was re remaining with the private funding was then able to have the handcuffs come off and be able to be more active on the policy level and further that mission uh, without the constraints of the government funding. Go ahead, uh, Michelle, maybe we can move on to the next slide here. Yeah, Any I just wanted to take a quick pause. Um, I know we've covered some different scenarios and considerations, but I just wanted to see if, if anybody had a particular consideration that they were struggling with that you would want to share um that we've got on the line we want to make sure this is something of value to you so i'm going to take a quick pause to see if any of our attendees and we have somebody calling in we have we have people in person so any questions at this time please make sure to take yourself off mute okay none at this time so i want us to move on to the merger overview um Again, I, it's wonderful to be able to have Ron here to talk about really how to define so that you know that you're articulating the correct type of um, partnership, if you will, or alliance. And so let's talk about mergers, Ron. Sure. So in contrast to an affiliation, which is, again, driven by contract terms and largely a blank slate between two organizations to figure out what they would like to do, a merger is a process in which two companies combine each other and fully integrate. So one company in, in this context is, is referred to as the acquirer and the other company is referred to as the target. Um, it shouldn't, no company should take offense um, by those terminologies. These would not happen in the, in the not-for-profit setting without two very willing companies. Um, at the conclusion of the merger, one of the companies ceases to exist. It does not exist anymore. And, and the mission of that company will continue as part of the mission of what's called the surviving company. So it's an integration of two companies into one that survives it. Uh, this process is defined in chapter 617 of the Florida statutes and is a very well-defined process. And I also wanted to mention as part of this um, high-level overview, there's a difference between a merger and an asset purchase. So in a merger of two organizations, the member interests, the units, or what in a for-profit setting would be called the stock of a company, cease to exist and they come together as one. In an asset purchase, like the um, North Florida example that I used, uh, one company could acquire all of the assets, meaning the operations of the company, contract assignments, um, personal assets like uh, equipment and computers and things like that, but leave behind the shares intact and the existing company can continue to operate. Sometimes an asset purchase will take the form of a particular division or line of a company so that the uh, surviving company, that's the acquirer, takes on the operations associated with that particular division. Um, sometimes it will acquire all of the assets of the company in the case of the North Florida example, where the only thing that was left for the for the uh, board of the company that sold all of its assets was this bank account and, and the um, contractual ability to make grants and furtherance of the mission. I think we have some more slides, Michelle, to go into a little more depth here. So in order to accomplish a merger, um, and this applies to domestic corporations and domestic meaning um, corporations authorized to do business in the state of Florida. It may be a little bit different if you're talking about organizations that are outside um, state boundaries or not authorized to do business in the state of Florida. And each corporation must adopt a plan of merger. And by adopt a plan of merger, it means that you would have a written document, presumably prepared by counsel, that would describe um, some of these elements I'll walk through that is ultimately approved by the board of directors and the members of an organization. And I'll pause for one second to describe that terminology. You're all very familiar with, the, with what board of directors means. Sometimes members in the not-for-profit setting gets conflated or confused a bit. Uh, when we mean members, what we do not mean 
his members in the sense of the YMCA having members who pay a monthly fee and they can go in and use the facilities. That is frequently referred to as a membership in the not-for-profit setting, but in the legal connotation of the word member in the not-for-profit setting is the equivalent of shareholder in the for-profit setting. Sh members in the not-for-profit setting could take two different forms. They could be prescribed persons or entities. So typically each hospital in the region has a foundation that's a um, separate legal entity and the member of the foundation would be the hospital entity. They control the shares. Uh, the, the law also provides that members could be the board of directors by virtue of holding that seat. And so those individuals, if in your governing documents, if they are identified as the members, they would be the ones to vote on this plan of merger. And as you can see, there are certain elements prescribed by law, uh, the names of the corporations uh, uh, proposing to merge, uh, the terms and conditions of the proposed merger, and that could be in a great level of detail or at a high level. Uh, a statement of the changes of the articles of the surviving corporation so that the entity that will live on typically has changes to its governing documents to accommodate, for instance, the assumption of some board members from the old uh, um, retiring organization uh, and maybe some uh, covenants in its governing documents about the continuation of certain aspects of the mission of the um, uh, organization that's the target and will be retiring. And then it also is required to have the manner and basis, if any, of converting the membership of each uh, corporation into the surviving entity. And so that would mean um, if, for instance, you are merging uh, two foundations and each was owned by a separate hospital, uh, the question would be what happens to the ownership interest, the membership interest of each hospital, and the plan of merger has to address those issues. Typically, um, those member interests would cease, but you could have a, a organization that is now commonly controlled by pre-existing entities. So if you had two hospitals, as a, for instance, and each had a foundation and they were combining together into one foundation, you could have joint ownership of that foundation by the two um, hospitals that came together to consummate the transaction. And then in addition to those required elements, um, you, you could include amendments that are, it's not mandatory, but you could include amendments or restatements of the articles, um, the effective date of the merger, and um, any other provisions relating to the merger that the parties feel important to um, ratify and approve at the board level. So maybe, okay, perfect. Um, so what happens then when the two entities merge? Um, Every uh, other corporation to the merger that merges into the surviving corporation uh, has its separate existence cease. I mentioned that. Um, title to all real estate and other property interests owned by each corporation um, vests in the surviving entity. So that one's important because unlike an asset purchase where you would actually have to sign a deed and transfer the real estate of the, of the property, maybe pay taxes on that transfer, or contracts that you may have that you have to assign. And if those contracts are not assignable, you have to approach the vendor or customer and ask their permission to assign the contract. Unlike those circumstances, um, these title transfers of, of property and assets in a merger happen by operation of law. Some contracts may have prohibitions on that happening without the permission of the other contracting party, but more frequently than not, once the merger is complete, all contracts automatically become contracts of the new entity and all real estate and personal assets and equipment and cars and things like that automatically by operation of law become property of the new entity. So there's some ease in transfer of assets. That's uh, an advantage of a merger. Um, the surviving corporation is responsible and liable for all of the liabilities and obligations of each corporation in the merger. So that's a very important point. Um, when you do an asset acquisition, so you transfer the car and you transfer the real estate and you transfer the employees by contract, you leave behind the liabilities of the entity. Uh, in a merger, you take the whole bag of goods, including any liabilities. So as a for instance, if the entity that did not survive 
had a slip and fall in their office building a year ago, but the statute of limitations for that is two years. The surviving entity, six months after the merger, could get sued by the individual who fell down uh, claiming negligence in that building, even though the current entity uh, had no relationship to that building or that, um, that party at the time the accident actually happened. So uh, typically in tort type settings, the statute of limitation is two years. In breach of contract settings, statute of limitations is typically five years. So when you do assume the liabilities of another company, you're buying that potential liability baggage um, <clears throat> within the statute of limitation period as well. Um, any claim existing or action or proceeding pending against any of the corporations merges into the um, surviving entity. So if there is an ongoing lawsuit, for instance, the surviving entity automatically becomes the party to that lawsuit. Um, clearly in due diligence, in, in the process of adopting the plan and merger, uh, all of these things would be sort of uh, sought out and, and discovered in due diligence and disclosed and dealt with accordingly. Um, neither the rights of creditors nor any liens upon the property of any corporation to the merger is impaired. So if there are UCC liens on equipment, if you've leased equipment and it's going to the new company, the liens follow. Um, if there's any creditor rights uh, against the entity that's going away, they are not erased, they are assumed by operation of law by the new entity. It essentially, the new entity stands in the shoes of the entity that's going to cease to exist. And the articles uh, of incorporation of the surviving corporation are amended to the extent uh, provided in the plan of merger to accommodate um, terms that might be negotiated between the parties. And the members of each corporation, uh, which are parties to the merger, are entitled uh, only to the rights provided in the articles of merger, meaning that, again, if you have the two hospitals and they're merging their two foundation subsidiaries, um, the entities that had rights prior to the merger only have existing rights as owners or as members after the merger if it's specifically stated in the governing documents and carried on they're not automatic i know that's a bit of a mouthful but what it underscores is prior to effectuating something like this there's quite a bit of due diligence uh, each party should do on its partner um, and things like real estate should be evaluated very carefully because you don't want to take on, for instance, um, liability for environmental contamination that could jeopardize the resources of the organization through executing something like this without the appropriate amount of due diligence. Ron, I was wondering, just for the good of, of the different types of organization that we have on the line, um, we have you know, some nonprofits, right, that are member-based. So member being, let me define that. So it's primarily going to be, <clears throat> it could be zoos, it could be arts organizations, it could be performing arts organizations. And some of their bylaws that, that I've seen um, require uh, a vote by their membership because they deem them a, measure, a member, right? They pay a certain amount and they're technically a stakeholder. That's how they define them. And so before they can move forward with uh, any type of merger, there needs to be a vote by the membership to dissolve the entity as it pertains, right? It's in their bylaws. So I didn't know if you had any um, way to speak to that at all. I mean, I, I know I've been a part of that. That can be a painful <laughs> experience yeah. when you have to do that. Um, it's always great, you know, to have an attorney, to have the board there so that you can try to explain um, at the highest level, not the detailed level that you've, what you've tried to do and find the best partner. But can you speak to that at all for those sort of membership-based organizations, even chambers, which I know I'm stepping a little bit out of 501c3, but that they really have that sort of ownness to share? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a common uh, foible of many not-for-profits that start small and end up, uh, and, and the idea is let's be egalitarian. And so whoever wants to be with us and joins us uh, has a say in the governance of the organization. But as organizations mature over time and as they grow in, in number, 
it becomes almost unmanageable to sustain that concept. So one example I can think of, I, there are many examples in my head, but I did some work for the Italian club in Ybor City a number of years ago, which was founded, I believe, in the, if I remember correctly, in the 1920s. And at the time the organization was founded, when you joined the organization, you got access to their healthcare clinic, you got access to their library, you got a burial plot in their cemetery, and you participated in governance of the organization. And as time went on, they never really amended those governing documents. So in the 90s, when I worked with them, technically, if you paid your $100 fee to join and help support the organization, their governing documents gave you, not only did they, get the, in their instance, give you the opportunity to participate in governance of the organization, but they gave you a burial plot and uh, access to now a non-existent clinic. So their documents just had not kept up with the times and I helped them conform those documents. Your specific question was membership. And what I would suggest to organizations um, like an aquarium or like a zoo that might have governing documents where the person who joins annually, the person who's joining annually really wants member benefits and that's usually access to the amenities of the organization. They're not really interested in participating in governance of the organization or being fiduciaries of the organization. So organizations that have grown in that way but still have remnants of membership being um, governance connected, what I would suggest to those organizations is before engaging in these types of transactions, either mergers or significant partnerships or affiliations, my suggestion would be to amend your governing documents to make clear that you still maintain your membership base in what you traditionally call the membership. So using the YMCA as an example, members get all the benefits of using the pool and using the facilities and those types of things. But you distinguish in your governing documents between that and state that those people don't have any say in the governance of the organization. And the members from a legal statutory perspective, either being vested in the board of directors or if you have a parent organization in some structure, that organization, that gives the, um, the true leadership of the organization, the board of directors, the ability to be nimble in their decision making. Um, as opposed, it, it's, for instance, the Tampa Chamber, I'm a past chair of the chamber. Tampa Chamber has close to a thousand members, um, last I understood. And some of the board members, constituents in their governing documents are elected by the membership. So they typically have an annual meeting in which a thousand individuals attend and they go through a perfunctory vote on some of those board members, but you can imagine what nightmare might erupt if you got a, a camp of 600 people and a camp of 200 people and another camp of 200 people who are in disagreement at that meeting as to what should happen. And as crazy as that sounds, um, Michelle, you and I um, make a fairly good living trying to help organizations navigate out of trouble once they've gotten themselves into trouble. So those kinds of things definitely happen and I would commend any organization that has conflated those concepts of um, activity membership with governance membership to carefully look at your bylaws and to consult with your, um, your consultants and your lawyers on how best to rectify that situation prospectively so that you can um, have some high level due diligence driven uh, data-driven discussions about partnerships and mergers in the future and, and really control the destiny of your organization without it um, having some rogue things being taken over. I, I did, um, I'm a past chair of the Tampa Club Board of Directors and um, during my chairmanship, the, the year before as I was coming into chair, there were circumstances where a group of individuals felt like the company wasn't being um, operationalized in a way that they thought appropriate and were very um, disruptive in some of the um, annual meeting uh, portions and tried to kind of wrest control of the company. Of course, I my approach was to welcome them um, and create a committee and revise the bylaws to try to get them to a point where everybody felt comfortable and good about it. But it, it, it distracted a lot of energy away from the mission of the organization because we, we had folks who had just joined, um, frankly, to eat dinner there. And all of a sudden they, by, by governance, they had a right to also try to govern the organization with having no information on its financials or its history or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you for elaborating on that. Um, it's always interesting to me how cultural institutions 
write their bylaws. And sometimes I wonder if it's because they view themselves a little bit differently as sort of a, a resource for the community. So they wanna position it that way so that if something arises that there's going to be this upheaval because a cultural institution or gem will be lost. So sometimes that's, that's a struggle. So let, let's talk about the difference between a merger and affiliation. Ron. Yeah, and this, <clears throat> this is intended to, to be a resource for those um, viewing here that they can kind of quickly go back to and, and see some of the significant differences. This list is not comprehensive, but on one hand, for instance, in a merger setting, one of the companies ceases to exist. In the affiliation, by contrast, both companies maintain their existence prospectively. In the merger, the assets and liabilities are combined um, and and um, into the new company. And so the new company is the owner of all of the assets of the old company, and it assumes all the liabilities of the old company. By contrast, in the affiliation, the assets and liabilities remain separate. Um, each company maintains its own existence and its own uh, separate set of balance sheet and, and liabilities. In the asset purchase, uh, I'm sorry, in the merger, the, the asset purchase is an alternative. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. Um, it's it's really kind of the only alternative to, to a merger in that context, whereas the affiliation has a lot of flexibility in its transaction structure. Um, in the merger, the management is combined. In the affiliation, by contrast, management remains separate, two boards of directors, two CEOs, two CFOs. Um, in the merger, there are advantages to reduce cost and an economy of scale. Um, JP Morgan uh, really was the one 100 years ago who, um, and they call it Morganizing still today, uh, the efficiency of combining two companies together and eliminating um, duplicate cost and making them more effective and more profitable. Um, there is a possibility of reduced cost in, in the, um, um, and it's not at the shame scale, it's at the same scale. That's a typo on my part at the bottom of the affiliations there. If you're wondering what the shame scale is, it doesn't exist, it's the same scale. Meaning that um, you can combine programs and you can um, accomplish some economies of scale in the affiliation model, but it's not gonna be at the same scale uh, of the cost reduction as the merger. And uh, again, we talked about the ease of the combination of assets in, in an affiliation. If you want to assign agreements or transfer property, you have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis uh, in a merger setting. All of those things by operation of law would uh, move over to the surviving entity. Ron, I wanted to ask you a question um, and then take a pause to see if we have any questions. But in either scenario, what in your experience have you felt needs to be the talent around the table that has come up? Um, I know in my personal experience, having done this, uh, and let me put on my previous executive director hat, right? I think an attorney was really important uh, to help with the legal documents. Um, having somebody with a financial acumen um, to really help, um, you know, a board member that serves on a, bo a board or is works for a bank. I think another uh, entity that was always helpful was somebody with a communications or public relations background um, that can help with uh, messaging to staff or the public when it's appropriate and how messages will be crafted. But tell me a little bit about in your experience who you feel could be either part of that task force or if they want to have these conversations, who, who do they need to kind of bring to the table, their team? Yeah, that's excellent. In my mind, five sets of consultants become very important, right? Uh, you mentioned your, your lawyer, your counselor. Um, you mentioned financial, and I would suggest your CPA should be at the table uh, to help with it. Um, third, um, you want a public relations organization because your messaging to your donors and to the press is, is extremely important in any kind of a combined endeavor. Um, Someone like yourself, Michelle, is indispensable in the process who can look holistically at the um, strategic vision that's to be accomplished by the proposed activity and then help connect that to the tactics to get there. So the first three people I mentioned are technicians. They're the folks who are going to help draft the documents and run the financials and craft the PR statements. 
but but a consultant like yourself who can come in and tie all of those things together and help talk through and facilitate the strategic discussion and apply it to the tactics. And then the fourth really is a, a valuation firm, in, particularly in the, in the not-for-profit setting, if there's any kind of exchange of, of compensation in these transactions, uh, the board as fiduciaries want to make sure that um, what they're getting and what they're giving is uh, of value to the company and serves the mission. And typically a valuation firm or some kind of consultant that does uh, appraises certain aspects of it is, is extremely useful. Thank you. And, I, um, I want to take a also, Go ahead. Sorry, I was also going to mention too, um, it's, it's a, the, the sixth one that's obvious is good leadership of the organization. But I would also suggest to those um, um, observing here that those talents, although many organizations have those talents on their board, I would suggest if they're engaging at this level in this type of transaction, it really should be disinterested consultants. You don't want the CPA who's on your board to be the CPA who's giving the advice because as a board member, they have to weigh in on their opinion. They have to express a vote on this and they may see the numbers but disagree with them. What you do want is an independent third party that other board members could ask questions of and feel that they're satisfying their fiduciary responsibility. So it's it's absolutely important to have diverse talent on the board and they know which questions to ask and what to do. But but those um, five disciplines uh, really should be external consultants if you're talking about a significant partnership or affiliation or, or a merger of the organization. Thank you. Did we have any questions from our attendees on either the difference between the two or clarification? Okay, so I wanted to move to this next slide. Um, and not trying to be repetitive in any way when we talk about some of these considerations. You know, one of the things we talked about was experience, and and I love the way that you outlined that, Ron. And and I say this respectfully, having un unfortunately learned this as a CEO first, and now it's actually part of our model. So we work with CEOs, and that was for me intentional, um, because when you are leading the organization through any of these particular um, uh, lanes that you're trying to navigate there's such an amount of energy that you're expending just continuing actually to keep daily operations, continuing to keep uh, the employees engaged and the morale and trying to think what it would look like. Like, I don't think people understand the amount of energy it takes. <laughs> and so having that experience around the table or in a task force is huge. I remember the first time that I went through that, I was just just mentally just drained and, and trying to straddle a fence. And I remember thinking at the time, since it was my first experience, you know, this wasn't your gifting, let's get the right people. And I think the PR piece was huge because um, that is something that if you are in a public trust and most nonprofits take that very seriously and their impact in the, in the community, um, you know, what is that going to look like? But I, I really can't stress enough the experience because I have found either from the search side of our business or the executive coaching side of our business that we don't have a lot of CEOs unless you were a, an executive director or CEO in 2008, to be quite frank, that has gone through this before, led these discussions where they've needed to right out of either financial or just that mission creep that we'll talk about in a minute. So there is a lack of experience when we look at the trends of we have boomers retiring um, now even sooner with what's happening this year with the pandemic, that a lot of the people that have been brought up at that experience level may not have this particular level of expertise. They may be more programmatically inclined as a CEO. They know the field itself, they know the trends, but from the business acumen, they just may have never done this before. So I think the experience is really um, one not to um, underestimate. And what I would also say, not try to, um, you know, you need to invest in that experience, um, particularly when you're dealing with the public trust. And then from the second point is really, you know, verifying, verifying, you know, is this going to be the appropriate partnership? Is it going to lead to a better outcome? Would it increase your service delivery? 
would it potentially generate more funding to meet the mission? Is it something that we mentioned to stabilize the, the finances? You know, I think one particular model that I've, you know, I've participated in and we continue to see, um, I've seen it throughout the state, is particularly arts organizations that um, whether it's because the state or even local funding, it, you know, it's not a priority. We have other priorities at this time. And I say this as somebody serving on the arts council and running an arts organization, but you really had a preservation trust years ago that got wiped out. And that was sort of the first signal to a lot of arts organizations performing and otherwise to say, you know, you really have to have funding mechanisms in place. And some didn't survive. And thus you have partnerships like Ringling with FSU. You now have had the Polk Museum of Art, which is now, you know, partnered um, with Florida Southern, Gulf Coast Museum of Art, which was then merged with St. Pete College. So there has been a history in our state of uh, historical organizations, quite frankly, that have moved on and merged with other entities um, because of either financial stability, um, or maybe a better partnership in education. And so that is, that's realistic. And we've even seen a few, there's a few organizations, unfortunately we're working with because of the pandemic, if they did not set up the proper uh, sustainable revenue income sources, they're either closing or they're looking for partners now. And so it is definitely something to, to think about. Um, competition. We worked with a client recently and I love the way they promoted it. Um, we worked with them actually a couple of years ago and it was originally called Because of Ezra, founded by a local couple. It moved on to be called BNB, which is neuroblastoma. And once they figured out that nationwide there were other parents wanting to start foundations to beat neuroblastoma, I really applauded the leader because they recently moved forward and created a national entity. So they realized that that power of the collective was far greater than the own agenda in one particular state and that they could come together and align for different research and causes. Um, and come under one national umbrella and that the funding could be funneled for the greater good. And we see that a lot, right? We see a lot of duplicity. So that mission creep is real when I, I think it comes to a consideration. And as much as I think nonprofits want to believe, and I say this wholeheartedly, we are different. You know, we make a different impact. The reality is that since we do start nonprofits as well, <laughs> Um, I always will tell people, are you sure there's nobody else doing that out there? And if so, have you considered a partnership or an affiliation? Because there is mission creep. It's just sometimes, as you alluded to, Ron, people don't want to really see that. They really think they have something different to offer. We see that a lot in veterans organizations. We see it also in cancer organizations. They're, they're amazing missions. But at the end of the day, are you really encroaching upon someone else's mission, which will ultimately create a challenge financially? The alignment of values, I think, is, is huge. I've seen some organizations where, um, particularly, I would say, and maybe child and department services is probably the best example, where um, there's, a, there's a lack of values on one organization or the uh, the ability to stay current or just because of the way maybe the system is. But I definitely see that alignment of values come up a lot when we talk about our most vulnerable population, um, children, not seniors necessarily, um, but children. And now we are starting to see a rise again in seniors. We work a lot with senior care groups along those lines. And then fulfilling, fulfilling commitment to any of the stakeholders. How do you classify a stakeholder? I think, Ron, you put that together great in terms of the difference of using the word membership. Um, this came up recently um, by many local chambers this year when we were looking at the PPP loan and what was being offered to 501c3s versus maybe what was being offered to 501c36s and, and how that money was dispersed. So, you know, what is that gonna look like when you're approaching this and what is your communication plan? So, with that, um, we put together, um, of course, beg, bar, and steal if you like, um, just sort of some merger steps. These are basic. It is not meant to be um, exhausted here, um, but thought it might be helpful that if you're looking for uh, maybe a step-by-step -step guide, it is not specific to an organization, but it's one that hopefully will um, make some sense after what we've shared today. 
um, you know, the board is a legal entity for a 501c3. So at the end of the day, if there is a dissolution of an organization, if it's a merger, if it's a partnership or an alliance, keeping the board abreast of what is happening um, or either participating in some way is extremely important. So you're going to see that brought up quite a bit here in terms of the steps um, and approving that um, the board approval for the nonprofit and the organization because they're the ultimate stewards of that organization. And so that's something that becomes even more apparent. And so if this is something that you're looking at, again, documents like your bylaws, your articles, even really how the board functions. And this is a shameless little plug, but I know Ron and I are actually gonna be tackling that topic um, later on in the month because bylaws really do come into play as you've heard a couple times, particularly when it comes to these types of things we've been discussing today. And then what's your migration and implement, implementation plan? So I've also worked with some organizations, I know Ron, you have two, where you have somebody that can shepherd you through the process, but then what happens when you have new team members? What happens when you have a whole new platform you have to work with? What happens if you're looking at other countries um, other states, what does the migration and implementation look like? And that is something that we see sometimes the ball dropped. And so what I would say is that you can also assemble a team to help with the migration and implementation. I've, I've yet to find, and I say this respectfully, an organization and the talent within the organization that could speak to example, your technology platform right, and combining those things. So there's certain levels of expertise as you're merging different positions from an HR perspective. Maybe you have to eliminate positions. Maybe you're combining positions. There's so many nuances that occur um, from a migration implementation and have heard feedback from clients that, you know what, we maybe should have invested some more in that because the what we did financially, that system really wasn't set and wasn't as robust, for example, to help us with what the team looks like now. Um, and so, and how do we have conversations with people that may not be able to move forward with the culture? So I think that's a big piece of the equation. And, and when you get into that point, having an HR perspective. So Ron, I wanted to take a pause and see if you had any comments on that. Yeah, I think you, <clears throat> I think you hit it, Michelle, uh, beautifully, and I couldn't have said it better myself here. So, in the interest of time, I'm gonna I defer. We can go to the next slide here. <laughs> okay. So, lastly, I just wanted to give everybody a perspective um, before we sort of open it up for questions. You know, where nonprofits are going, and this has been a topic I know we've been tackling specifically the last nine months, but we also tackle it when we work with sort of governance structures and nonprofits. And it's hard. It's hard for some CEOs, depending on where you fall in terms of your leadership style or even boards. But where we're really heading, if you haven't figured it out, and I think the pandemic has pushed it quite a bit, you know, your systems are changing, how you distribute data, how you um, work with remote or virtual employees and how you manage them. Um, the layers of management are changing and how we work with employees. And so culture is huge in terms of retaining employees and culture will continue to be huge even if you look at alliances and mergers. So I wanted to just share this with you because this is sort of a back-to-back -back shift of what's happening and what's trending now what we see in nonprofits. And so in each of these layers, if these are things that you're not equipped or maybe you don't have the skill set, I mean, of course, we'd be happy to help. Experts like Ron are happy to help. But each one is a very different nuance. Structure, that infrastructure, systems, your platform, your HR systems, payroll, whatever that is, do not underestimate IT. We've seen that even in virtual you know, um, presentations. And then culture. We're really seeing this need for emotional intelligence. So if these are services that you require um, but this also goes in tandem and can be somewhat highlighted when you're going through a merger. We did want to let you know about some of the upcoming trainings um, and if you wanted to uh, join us in the future. And then lastly, uh, just wanted to open up for any final thoughts or questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. If you feel that this is something to be more confidential and you don't want to do it online, 
um, you're more than happy to do that. So we wanted to provide you information to both Ron or I um, and just reach out to us. But with that, I'm going to take a brief pause and see if any of our attendees have any final questions or thoughts. I'm going to chat. Okay. Well, we don't have any. Um, someone has commented they're going to reach out to you directly on uh, Ron. So I want to thank you so much, Ron, for your expertise. It's always fun. I learn so much every time I talk to you. So thank you for your willingness to do this and really, I think, provide that legal perspective. I think that's important for people to hear. I hope you all have a wonderful day. And uh, thank yeah. you again for popping in. Yep, thank you all for joining us. And, and Michelle, thanks for putting this all together. As always, it's great working with you. and. Um, I'll leave you with this. Um, put your heart in your mission and just keep driving forward. Everything's going to, everything's going to be good through these crazy times. Thank you all for being here today. See y'all soon. Okay. I have dismissed the attendees. So any final thoughts or comments, Mr. Ron? No. Uh, are we, are we still <laughs> recording? We get to do it again in a couple of weeks, so we we'll get it yeah. down. <laughs> Are we? Should we uh, end the recording? Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So. Okay, we are done. <laughs>